If you're thinking about cedar for your wall cladding or maybe this composite for lower maintenance, but how to stop this happening? I went for a different solution. I'll tell you why in the video and give you some tips and costs to consider. Some of the plastic and composite cladding products are okay. I'm just not sure I want to be looking out at some dull plastic box year after year, which is going to date as fashions and manufacturing involves. Do appreciate that's a personal opinion. You may love it and good luck to you. Instead, could have something unique, natural and timeless for pretty much the same cost. So if you're interested in timber, today I'm gonna to choose between larch and cedar. And I love cedar and I love larch. They're both truly beautiful. But the minute they're up, if they're untreated and exposed, they're already deteriorating. Now that deterioration doesn't affect performance. It's just the way it looks. The aesthetic and there are two ways the finish begins to deteriorate. First is uneven graying where parts of the cladding are exposed to more intense ultraviolet rays than in other areas which results in a dirty looking elevation that is pretty much impossible to deal with. And the other is chemical change as the resins and saps within the timber begin to bleach. Mold can find its way through and it can form a black staining effect. There are various protective products out there, products which are pretty expensive, time consuming to keep applying year after year. You'd need this much for this area, not cheap, and I'm not sure whether the finish is ever as good as when it first goes up. You can also sand a few millimetres off, but that's a lot of work, and not all of us have the tools, nor the time, nor the knowledge to know how to do it properly. But whichever way you try to maintain that look, you'll never get that lush, intoxicating, fresh look to remain longer than a couple of months. So most people end up just giving up after a year or two when the enthusiasm wanes and living with the uneven staining. I think it's a bit naughty of these garden room companies to never show pictures of their cedar clad buildings after a couple of years because the reality of these products is they're gonna stain unevenly. So instead of cedar, I'd rather focus on a natural product where I can avoid this discoloration process completely, where I'm going to pre-weather it to a uniform finish before I fix it to my facade. And that way I don't need to worry about staining. I'm choosing a timber, Scottish larch. There's larch in all parts of the UK and Northern Europe. There's also the Rolls Royce of larch, Siberian larch but this is in, now in short supply due to the geopolitical stuff and its rarity has made it become an awful lot more expensive compared to homegrown larch. Siberian larch is a slightly different aesthetic, but I love the homegrown stuff too. What do you think? On to the cladding and now that we have chosen our product, we want to think about the direction and the spacing of our boards. And for that, I'll draw out an elevation and sketch out some different alternatives if you don't have the time for that, understandable if you're not used to CAD or sketching, you can use something like Pinterest, which is useful for distilling down your design ideas for construction projects such as these. Things I'm thinking about to help me with my decisions are whether I want the emphasis to be on the width or the height, how I want the screens and the windows to be. For example, here I want this punched look and next is how the boards are joined. Tongue and groove is always reliable. You also have this overlap method, but today I'm going for an open rain screen. I love the textures with the shadow gaps and an open rain screen has more uniformity to it versus that tongue and groove look, which I just feel is a bit boring and everyone's doing it. An oak cladding screen works best with an eight millimeter gap and I like a narrow board, so a finished size of 68 millimeters over the larger size and the overall interval between each will be 76 millimeters. We call that size the cover, so 76 millimeters cover. We would call it centers if we were doing joist spacings. I'll use this size to work out my window dimensions and crucially before I order my screens since I don't want to be cutting strips of cladding along their lengths. Here you want to consider a 14 millimeter tolerance for your windows, so around seven millimeter extra around the frame times two, and that gives you the space to maneuver the screens in whilst being small enough to fully cover the gap. Now to speed up this silvering process, I'm going to cheat a little bit and use this system which was developed by this company from Sweden. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name uh, Siu, Siu, 
but it works on the basis of silicon molecules which grow and expand in the cells and around the wood fibres and the process then fuses the silicon to the wood, strengthening it and offering a shield that protects and gives the surface a natural grey tint. This mimics the process of greying that occurs in natural light with timber. This is the undercoat which starts the process and then there's a finishing coat to seal and preserve. And I'll be sure to treat all the cut ends in the same way. And patience is something we must learn in all aspects of life, but especially in construction. If I wasn't using this product, I'd grey them in our builder's yard or my garden and away from any shade so we can get uniform greying. Use a thicker profile to prevent twisting and I'll come back to that twisting in a minute. I don't have the time here to get into the amount of regulation around cladding. It is a video I think I will link to below but there are further retarders you can add to timber cladding to increase its fire rating. You just need to be aware of it and the distance to the boundaries. I'm also using a fire retardant and UV resistant breather membrane because we're having an open screen system where natural light hits we need the UV resistance to prevent the membrane failing over the years and I want something that's black so we get the maximum contrast of the cladding sitting in front of it. I'm making a separate video about all things membrane, vapour, air tightness, humidity and breathability since it's another thing to get your head around and I get loads of questions on it. For my battens, because it's an open screen, I want to paint these in black to match the membrane. Before fixing them, I don't want to see them behind the silver larch, so I'm using this bitumen paint which will also preserve the life of the battens. And starting with the verticals, I'm screwing through the membrane and the warm wall insulation and into the wall studs with these long hex screws and then over the top with horizontal battens using my nail gun this time and I'll do this at 600 centers. I've carefully stacked the cladding in rows with spaces around all sides to let the air flow to minimize twisting. Although it's a bit of a disappointment to see such an expensive product delivered fresh off the lorry from my suppliers in the north of Scotland, it's twisted beyond what I'd consider an acceptable level. Many of these are out by at least millimeters along a three meter length. And what's worse is, because I had to wait almost three months for this cladding to arrive, it's not an option to return it, even if I thought there was a remote possibility that the supplier would agree to it. This is the UK construction industry, not Amazon. So we need to make do with twisted boards and for that I'll be having to lever them straight using brute force and sometimes with some clamps. What a joke. Here's my setting out using my 76mm cover and I'll temporarily fix these boards at static key points to make sure I place the screens correctly and then I'll start with the easy bits. I'll measure and cut all the shorter pieces using this little cutting jig I made up. You can of course use a miter saw but I have no power on this site yet and I'm not lugging something the size and weight of a cordless chop saw up and down every day. If I can't get all the tools I need to build this little house in two of these boxes then I'm going to go without and use hand tools. I'll cut and treat the edges and then I'm using these stainless steel screws which I'm piloting in at set points to match the batten positions to ensure these fixings all looking neat and coordinated on the elevation once the boards are all up. If I'm using wider boards, say 145mm with a 153mm cover, I'll use two screws at the fixing points to prevent cupping, but a single fixing is fine for these narrower boards. You can use a nail gun with stainless steel ring shanks, but then you need to consider two fixings per board, and with a nail gun it's impossible to get it neat. Cladding is not something you can scrimp on, starting with the fixings. I'm using these boxes uh, this much for 200, so we're into over this much for the fixings alone, just for this one elevation. I'll drive the fixings in so they just grip at the surface of the timber. I don't want to pierce the surface of that silver as I'll risk getting uneven colour around the fixings. 
cladding suppliers have a host of additional stuff they try to sell you from their own cladding batten systems to a load of different fixing systems. I think they're over engineered, another word for overpriced. They'll also try and sell you accessory things like this, synthetic strips that purport to preserve the inside of the cladding against the batten. You can buy pretty much everything from your local merchants for probably half the price and this large cladding development is about as exposed, wet and windy a location as you could get in Northern Europe and has none of that paraphernalia. Been up for close on 10 years and if you look into the rain screen cavity the boards are still brand new. Their service and system and supply lines are geared up for the big house builders and developers, not for the many small projects from small architect builder developers like me. I had to pay over £200 for delivery of this tiny pallet, a minimum order requirement limited my options, the lorry was crammed up with pallets to volume house builders paying the same as me for much bigger orders. No wonder we don't end up supporting our homegrown industry in construction. I think this company are doing wonderful things but their focus doesn't seem to be on small contractors. I'll start with my first vertical and get it dead level and you really need to take your time with the first one, make sure your level is calibrated. I like the Stabiler 1800 millimeter bead, a laser would also be handy. I'm using these spacers to get my cover right so the combination of a 5 and a 3 millimeter packer will do it and I'll start in the middle so I can leave it in from the centre point from the top and bottom and then I'll work my way up and down from that centre point. I need to keep checking that everything is totally vertical and I need to use running dimensions to ensure my spacings are not getting out of sync with my cover dimension of 76mm. I call it Chinese whispers. Just a millimetre out here and there will mean a headache around these window and door jams where the cladding will start to encroach into the glazing and ruin your elevation. This is one of these projects that is reasonably easy to complete but only provided you are super disciplined with your preparation before you actually start. I see joiners and carpenters having to do workarounds for their openings in order to get their cladding to work because they had no say in those dimensions and the architects didn't think it through at design stage. Drawing out and sizing your screens only after you have chosen your cladding and agreed the insulation is counterintuitive, not something you might think about perhaps, but hopefully by watching films like these you can see how we always build better things by embracing the design and the planning as well as learning about the build process itself. I'll be making a video about why you need to be using warm wall construction for your walls. Avoid doing it like this and I'll do one showing how I created this parapet using the roof membrane, why I prefer that kind of minimalist detailing over these plastic fascia details. So have a look for those on the channel. If you want to chat, you can get in touch with me here. Hit me a like if you can. I promise you it does make a huge difference. I'll see you next time.